Kepler knew this stuff 400 years ago. How do you not know it? Hi, I'm Mike Siegel. I'm an astrophysicist. I write for Ordinary Times, and this is The Throughput. So today I'm going to go back to the obscurity well to talk about an episode of Doctor Who in the classic series. But stick with me because we're going to get into some cool things about celestial mechanics and orbits and giant slugs. And at the end, I'm going to tie this to a current event or soon to be current event that will talk about all of these, except for the giant slug bit that I know of. Today's culprit is the 1984 episode, The Twin Dilemma. This is generally regarded as one of the worst ever episodes of Doctor Who, and it's really not hard to see why. The script is really bad. The acting is unusually poor. The incidental music, which is usually a strength for Doctor Who, sounds like someone got one of those 1980s keyboards where you could record a sound and pitch it up or down and recorded a fart on it and decided to go with that. The plot is nonsensical, and it kicks off the sixth Doctor's run by making him a colossal jerk who violently assaults his companion. So the science is only one of the reasons why this episode stinks on ice. But stink it does, and there is one scene in particular that involves a colossal amount of bad astronomy. In this episode, giant slugs have taken over the planet of Jaconda, and the chief slug, Nestor, has kidnapped two mathematical prodigies in order to enact a scheme to move two other planets into Jaconda's orbit to serve as larders for the slugs to grow more slugs. In other words, we're already off on a bad foot. There's no reason to assume that just because you move these planets to Jaconda's orbit, that would make their climates habitable. That would depend on the mass of the planet, the chemical composition, the geological history, whether they still have active magnetic fields and so forth. But sure, let's assume that whatever, whatever technology you have to move planets from one orbit to another would be able to terraform. Where it really goes wrong is when we find out what Nestor's plan actually is. Now, the BBC have a tendency to be twitchy on videos like this. I've gotten copyright claims, and usually when I respond saying this is fair use for educational purposes, they let it slide. The BBC is the only ones who haven't. And so I'm just going to show some stills and use a silly voice to try to illustrate how silly the BBC is being about, so, about fair use. Both the outer planets are smaller than Jaconda. That's obvious. Well, so is the consequence if they are brought any nearer the Jacondan sun. But you're right. Why didn't I realize? You didn't realize because he's talking nonsense. Your mind was on other things, my friend. Yes, but to overlook something so simple. What are you two talking about? Yeah, I kind of like to know that too. A matter of simple physics. The gravitational pull of the sun on Jaconda is more or less consistent, yes? I'll take your word for it. The outer planets are smaller. Place them where Jaconda is. How long do you think they'll last? No time at all. Their orbit would rapidly decay and they'd crash into the sun, causing an enormous explosion. Later we find out that this is actually the point. Nestor plans to deliberately explode Jaconda's sun to scatter his people's eggs all over the cosmos and infest other planets. There is so much stupid in this plan, I don't even know where to start. First, the idea that these planets would fall into the sun because their mass is smaller than Jaconda's is absolute tommy rot. Planetary orbits, as Kepler proved four centuries ago, depend on the distance from the sun and the speed of the orbit. That's it. Mass is irrelevant. In our solar system, the two smallest planets are Mercury and Pluto. Mercury is the closest to the sun. Pluto is the furthest away. Neither of them is in danger of falling into the sun. That's how gravity works. It accelerates all objects the same regardless of mass. This is what Galileo proved, again, centuries ago. You may have heard of this experiment he did where he dropped iron balls off the Leaning Tower of Pisa. At the time, it was thought that gravity made heavy things fall faster than lighter things. A cannonball will fall faster than a feather. But Galileo proved this wasn't the case. If you drop two cannonballs of different weight so they have the same shape, they will hit the ground at roughly the same time. Feathers fall more slowly because, unlike cannonballs, evolution has designed them to catch the air and float rather than fall straight down to the ground. Cannonballs do not float in the air. In fact, I've linked a video in the description where they have an iron ball and a feather in a vacuum chamber and drop them at the same time, and they hit the ground at the same time. Without that wind resistance, gravity works the same. It does not care about the weight. It accelerates everything the same. 
That principle of gravity applies to planets, asteroids, comets, satellites, or giant cosmic space geese. Sun's gravity is no different from Earth's gravity. It will accelerate them at the exact same rate. So whether you have a big planet or a small planet, they will feel the same acceleration due to gravity. The reason why this is the case was figured out by Isaac Newton. The force of gravity on an object does increase with mass. The more massive the object, the more intense gravity will pull on that object. However, the more mass of an object, the more it resists being accelerated. Force equals mass times acceleration. That's Newton's second law. So the bigger the object is, the more force you need to move it. So when gravity acts on objects, this exactly cancels. Gravity gets stronger as the object gets more massive, but it takes more force to move the object in the first place. So in the end, the effect of gravity, the acceleration, is exactly the same whether it's the moon orbiting around the earth or an apple falling out of a tree. That was Isaac Newton's insight. That was his genius to realize that the laws of physics that govern the cosmos were no different from the laws of the physics that govern our everyday lives. Massive objects, whether they are stars, black holes, or neutron stars, they are not giant vacuums that suck in everything. They are literally forces of nature bound by rules we have understood for centuries. If you moved the Earth to Jupiter's orbit and matched Jupiter's orbital speed, it would stay in that orbit just fine. In fact, we have a good reasons to believe that planets in our solar system have migrated, especially in the early solar system. They changed orbits, they moved around, they moved closer to the sun, they moved further away from the sun. That may have happened, and they didn't go plunging into the sun because they changed their distance. In fact, it is 100% possible for these planets to share an orbit with Jaconda, and having them smaller than Jaconda actually makes that easier because of a thing we call Lagrange points. In celestial mechanics, a Lagrange point is where the gravity of two bodies and the speed of an orbit match in such a way that something at a Lagrange point will stay at that Lagrange point relative to the two bodies. There are five Lagrange points. L1 is between the two objects. In the case of the Earth-Sun system, that is 1.5 million miles closer to the Sun away from the Earth. And this is a very stable point for an object to be at. It can stay in that object basically indefinitely. The SOHO satellite, one of NASA's most successful missions, sits at the L1 point. Actually, it sits in a halo orbit, so it moves out of that, around that point, so we can communicate with it. And it has been at that point for 25 years and has never fallen into the Sun, not even once. The L2 point is away from the smaller object. This is 1.5 million miles further out from the Sun than the Earth. The WMAP probe sits there. Things can stay there without exerting any fuel. Now, the L3 point is on the opposite side of the Sun, basically where Earth's orbit is opposite the Sun. We haven't put anything there because we wouldn't be able to communicate with it. But the L4 and the L5 points, those are the interesting ones. Those are exactly 60 degrees away from the Earth along its orbit. These are sometimes called the Trojan points. And if you put an object there, it would have the same distance and same orbit as Earth and be completely stable. Well, mostly stable. There are other bodies in our solar system. Jupiter and Saturn will perturb them and so forth. But the idea is the same. Trojan points are very real. They are not theoretical constructs. Jupiter has over a million asteroids in its Trojan points, what we call the leading Trojans forward in its orbit and the trailing Trojans uh, further behind in its orbit. Asteroids are obviously trillions of times smaller than Jupiter, and they stay there just fine. So this idea that Jaconda's sister planets would plunge into the sun is just silliness. It defies what we know about physics. And this isn't something new or something complicated. This is something we've known about for centuries. And Nestor's plan is even overly complicated. He plans to put one a day ahead and one a day behind in time to occupy the same space. You don't need to do that. Just put them at the Trojan points. If you have the technology to move planets in time and space, just move them to the Trojan points and you're done. It's over. In fact, there have been science fiction novels that have been based on this premise of putting planets at smaller planets at Trojan points so that people can expand their living space. This is all basic, basic stuff, stuff we've known for centuries. This is Kepler, Galileo, Newton. There's no excuse for a 20th century writer to get this kind of thing wrong. But it's actually worse than that. The doctor says that when the planet falls into Jaconda's sun, it will explode. What? Planets are teeny tiny compared to their star. The entire 
planetary mass of our solar system is 1% of the mass of the sun. You could send the, all the planets plunging into the sun and it wouldn't even notice. In fact, since this episode was made, we've discovered there are many planets that orbit very close to their sun. And it's likely that many planets have plunged into their sun and been consumed and they didn't explode. Jaconda's sun is never going to go supernova. In my Addicted to Love video, I talked about the ages of stars and how stars that are explode, stars that go supernova, have to be at least eight times the mass of the sun. Well, the bigger a star, the shorter it lives. Stars that go supernova only live for maybe tens of millions of years. It takes billions of years for life to evolve on a planet. So Jaconda's sun must be low mass. Otherwise, you wouldn't have life on its planets. If it's low mass, it's never going to go supernova. The core is literally never going to get heavy enough to overcome those quantum mechanical forces that it needs to for the core to implode and create a supernova. So that's not going to happen, and it's certainly not going to happen just because you sent a planet crashing into it. Even if Jaconda's sun could explode, this is still a terrible plan. At one point, the doctor gets one of the eggs and shines a laser cutter on it, and it warbles a little bit to show that they're sensitive to heat. A laser is a mosquito's kiss compared to the literally star-shattering power of a supernova. Nothing would survive. Planets may actually survive. The first planet we, planets we ever discovered outside of our solar system were orbiting a pulsar, which is the shriveled husk of a star that went supernova. But organic material eggs, no, they're not going to survive. Moreover, look at the sky. Stars are few and far between. There's light years between them. You could send millions of these eggs out there and none of them might reach a habitable planet. And if they did, it would take millions of years to get there. You have a spaceship. You have a spaceship that travels at warp speeds, that breaks the speed of light. Just load your eggs onto a ship and take them to the planet of your choice. That's going to be much more effective than this cockamamie plan to blow up a star. This is insane. Now, there is actually an episode of the old series called The Seeds of Doom, which uses this idea intelligently. In that episode, an invasive species called the crinoid is dug up in the Antarctic, and it's a carnivorous, intelligent plant that's going to take over the planet. And the doctor guesses that the way they migrate is that their planet erupts, it sends these seeds into space, and they reach other planets. It's still a little bit of a silly concept, but it actually does it right because these crinoid pods have been buried in the snow for millions of years. Therefore, it takes millions of years for these seeds to spread in the galaxy, which, while it's still a silly plan, is a little more feasible than Nestor's plan to conquer the galaxy, you blowing up his planet. Now, the rule of the red pen is I have to leave the story beats basically intact, but just fix the science. Well, Doctor Who, congratulations, you're the first story to beat me. There is no way to actually fix this without changing the story fundamentally. Nestor's plan is insane, and it depends on understanding of physics that would get you flunked out of a high school course. There's no way you can make this work that doesn't violate the laws of physics or make a lick of sense. But if you ask me to totally rewrite this story, here's what I'd do. I'd make Nestor the good guy. If his plan is to move two planets to Jaconda's Trojan points and make them habitable, that's a good plan. That would allow his people to live on one planet, the native Jacondans to live on another planet, and they could play rock, paper, scissors for the third one. Maybe in this story, the Jacondans were just so repulsed by Nestor's appearance and so disgusted by him, they overlooked the fact that he was actually trying to find a peaceful solution. And this plan of moving planets is going to be that peaceful solution. Create enough living space for everyone. Yeah, that would fundamentally alter the story. But it not only would be more scientifically accurate, I think it would make a better story. And it would be especially good story for the doctor. If he found out that he prejudged these slugs as being evil because of their appearance and later found out that they were the good guys and they had a plan for peaceful coexistence that, yeah, involved crazy things like moving planets, but would have worked, it would have forced him to confront his arrogance, his prejudice. It would have been a really great way of bringing his character full circle through the episode to the point where he comes back to that place of humility and compassion that we've always liked about the Doctor instead of being a colossal jerk for the next season and a half. Now, there's still a lot wrong with this episode. The bad science is only a part of it. But notice that if you fix the science, you fix the plot, you fix the plot, you fix the character development. 
I don't think that the science was the root of what went wrong with this episode. I think it's a symptom of a really poorly thought out episode, a really poorly scripted episode. It was like the end of the season and they were, were so focused on making the doctor a jerk, they didn't bother to write a good episode. So this, I think this was fixable. I think this was salvageable. It would have needed a lot of work. I don't think the twin dilemma had to be this bad. Now I said at the beginning, there was a reason I wanted to talk about this. In a couple of months, hopefully, the James Webb Space Telescope is going to launch. If it works, if it launches, if it unfolds properly, it will be the most sensitive and powerful instrument we have ever put into space. And it's going to be at the L2 point because that is a stable location for the telescope, which will not only bring it far away from the Earth so that it can stay cold, but allow it to stay oriented so that that sun shield is always protecting it from the heat of the sun. And so this, these Lagrange points aren't just theoretical things for science fiction fans. These are solid, hairy fact that we use in real life engineering and astrophysical concepts. And so it's a pity that this episode ignored that to go with this absolute silliness when they could have made it interesting and locked it into something very solid and very real. So that's it. I'll be back in a couple of weeks, uh, hopefully with another video. In the meantime, I'm Mike Siegel. I write for Ordinary Times. Uh, enjoy science, enjoy movies, enjoy science and movies, and thank you for watching.